videotape live at the studios of City Video. It is time for Cannabis Common Sense, the show that tells you the truth about marijuana and the politics behind its prohibition. Now here's the host of your show, Paul Stanford and Paul Loney. Hello and welcome to another exciting edition of Cannabis Common Sense. Our show is a production of our Oregon Political Committee campaign for the restoration and regulation of hemp. Uh, my name is Paul Stanford and I would like to introduce my co-host, our attorney, our treasurer, chief petitioner, and the president of the Oregon Wildlife Federation, Paul Loney. Thanks, Paul. Uh, that's correct. Um, I am all those things, and I'm also here to tell you what our initiative is all about. It's a comprehensive system to regulate cannabis, uh, marijuana, here in the state of Oregon. It would allow the sale of marijuana uh, to medical patients through pharmacies at cost. It would allow the sale to adults over 21 um, of, of uh, psychoactive marijuana in state liquor stores. Um, allow people to grow it at home for their own personal use and allow our farmers to grow it um, you know, and for products. It's the non-psychoactive variety to take part in the uh, world trade, as it, as it were. Um, and tonight we're real fortunate to have, once again, a special guest, um, an attorney all the way from Hawaii. Um, he used to live here in Portland, he used to live in Washington, D.C., he used to live in Texas, but right now he's sitting on a couch next to me, um, <laughs> and uh, this is Lanny Sinkin. Thank you, Paul. It's a pleasure to be here. All right, and so you're here for on behalf of a couple of um, cases that I'm involved with, so but why don't you tell us about the, um, the CRH case, the campaign restoration case, as the Ninth Circuit likes to call it. Right. This is a, a civil rights action brought in uh, Portland on behalf of uh, three political organizations and one individual. And it stems from the city of Portland using public resources for partisan political purposes. The story begins when the uh, campaign to pay for schools by regulating cannabis uh, announced its petition drive to put an initiative on the ballot mm. in January of 1995, I guess exactly. that would have been. Exactly, January of 1995. It's our first effort. At the, on the same day that they held their press conference announcing that, the official spokesperson for the Portland Police Department, an officer named Jensen, uh, appeared before the television cameras to question the motivations of those uh, who were sponsoring this initiative. And that act alone constitutes official opposition to signature gathering, which is against state law in Oregon, more importantly is an unconstitutional use of public funds for partisan purposes. The Fourth Amendment to the United States Constitution guarantees all citizens a Republican form of government, what that means is that while people may delegate their power to a government, the government cannot in operate partially on behalf of any group within the society. It must be responsible to all the people where the power continues to reside. So for our government to use public resources in a partisan way to try and defeat one side of a political issue is both illegal and unconstitutional. And once uh, Officer Jensen did come out publicly opposing the initiative, uh, Paul Stanford wrote to the uh, mayor, Mayor Katz at the time and still, uh, saying that this was an illegal act and requesting the mayor to tell the police not to do this kind of thing. There was no response to that letter. A copy of that letter went to the chief of police, Mr. Moose. Uh, Mr. Stanford then wrote, uh, a, uh, then called the mayor's office to ask why there had been no response. And the mayor's aide said that there would be no response because the mayor agreed with what the police officer was doing, disagreed with the initiative. So that gave an official imprimatur, an official okay, to the eagle, illegal use of public funds to campaign against the gathering of signatures on this initiative, and indeed prompted further police action along the same lines. Uh, two officers uh, tried to prevent the issuance of a permit for the annual hemp festival. Uh, Jeff and Susie Crawford are key organizers of that annual event. Jeff had applied for the permit for the event. Uh, two police officers went to the Parks Department and tried to convince the Parks Department not to issue the permit. 
Had the Parks Department not issued the permit, it would have been a clearly unconstitutional act, a clear civil rights violation for the hemp event sponsors, a denial of their civil rights. Uh, here you have two police officers paid in their official position with the sanction of their supervising police officer trying to convince other public employees to act unconstitutionally to suppress an event at which signatures were to be gathered on an initiative. Again, a violation of state law, a violation of constitutional principles. So, so those two officers were named as well. I remember in that case, once Jeff Crawford uh, was saying that, uh, complaining to the police officer and said that something like, uh, you know, this is a violation of our constitutional rights. And one of the officers that's included in the suit responded that uh, the Constitution doesn't mean anything. Right. And so that's uh, the type of mentality <laughs> we're dealing with here. Right. And yeah. the, what, what the police officers did, too, was uh, once the, fortunately, the Parks Department simply would not go along with them mm. and did issue the, the permit, as they should have. Once that was done, the police then organized their own counter event, and they wanted to put it right next to the Hemp Festival, and the Parks Department put it down the street. Yeah. But it was a counter event that included bringing in seized vehicles, helicopters, Coast Guard boats, uh, all kinds of intimidation to strike fear into those that would be attending the Hemp Festival. Uh, I trust it was perceived by them more as entertainment than a source of fear, but it was designed to instill fear in them. Well, you know, we do face fear I in our campaign. Most I, I can't think of a single other political organization that has to deal with supporters' paranoia the way we do. There are people who don't want to call us, don't want to sign our petitions because they're afraid that the police are going to come after them. And having the police come out in the media this way just reinforces that fear that uh, our organization has to deal with that no other political group today that I know of has to deal with. I mean, during the civil rights uh, actions in the 60s, the civil rights organizations right. had to deal with police That's repression. Right. But today, I can't think of others. No, this is, and it's an important point. It's really what the civil rights law was designed to prevent, which was the use of public power to suppress unpopular political movements. And the case that we have brought is a, civil, a case under the Civil Rights Act. Um, after the hemp event was held, uh, two other officers, one from the Marijuana Task Force and one from the D.A.R.E. program, were approached by a reporter doing a story about the initiative, and they gave statements opposing the initiative and why they opposed the initiative, again, directly contradictory to state law that forbids such activity by public employees for good reason. I mean, the law is based on the idea that the public government cannot use public resources to fund one side of a political campaign. The law does make a distinction between statements of personal opinion and statements that are violations of this law. If a police officer working for the Marijuana Task Force wants to sit around his kitchen table and tell his friends that he thinks that the initiative is a terrible idea, that's one thing. When he's giving an interview to a member of the press in his official position, with his official identification, on official time, paid for by all the taxpayers. In uniform. In uniform, that's a whole other thing. And that's what we have here with the five officers that have been named in the suit. Uh, a very, um, how should I put it, biased judge uh, that we faced here in Portland uh, threw the case out saying that there were no federal claims identified in this case. Uh, that we've taken up on appeal uh, to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, by the time this show is aired, I think that appeal will have been heard. Correct. Uh, and we will be waiting for a decision. Uh, part of the, the rule under the Civil Rights Act is for a municipality to be liable, and we have named the city of Portland as the, the chief defendant in this case. Uh, you must have a policy being implemented. And one of the, one of the in indicators that there is a policy is if official policymakers ratify the actions that were violations of civil rights. Well, when Mayor Katz said that she was go not going to take any action regarding Officer Jensen's illegal statements to the press, and in fact supported those statements because she opposed the initiative, then Mayor Katz made the city of Portland liable for any damages that a jury would care to award to the three organizations or Mr. Crawford, who's also a plaintiff in this instance. And I should say that another piece of the puzzle is that we filed uh, complaints, or actually Paul Stanford filed complaints with the state. The state 
uh, has to enforce the election laws. So those complaints were filed with the State Elections Division, uh, asking that they penalize the police officers who were violating state law. And we did a, a dance with that uh, state group that went on for more than three years, if I'm correct, or somewhere in the yeah, neighborhood of somewhere two and a half yeah. years, before we could ever get any kind of real response from the state government that's supposed to be enforcing the state law. Uh, but the state law is quite clear that state employees, particularly municipal employees, are not to engage in political activity uh, funded by the municipality. And that that's a law that's posted where they can all see it. They are all aware of it. Uh, it was very interesting in the newspaper interviews where the two officers came out opposed to the initiative. Other state employees said, we are not allowed by law to comment directly on an initiative. They did comment on what effects the initiative might have on the administration of their particular agency, things like that, perfectly legitimate. But the police were right up front. Uh, one officer said, I'm opposed to the initiative. That was his lead statement. So we had a whole series of violations. We went to the state government and asked them to do something about it. They wouldn't do anything about it. We went to the municipal government, asked them to do something about it. They wouldn't do anything about it. So we eventually had to go to the federal courts, and we will now wait and see what the federal court has to say about whether the relief that's being sought, which is an injunction to prevent them from doing this kind of thing while the new campaign is going on, uh, will indeed be entered. If it is, it'll be additional protection for people who are trying to gather the signatures, an acknowledgement that people who are trying to gather the signatures are entitled to the protection of the Civil Rights Act. It would be very helpful in that sense. Um, Just in the past year, I've had the police, the Portland police, uh, marijuana task force agents uh, oppose us in, in the media several times again. So it's continuing. It's clear they're not getting the message. Right. Um, and we hope this lawsuit will send that message and that it's also clear that when people are afraid to participate in the political process, we have a real problem. And I hope that people who want to support the initiative will not be afraid. And the way to, to get past the fear is to simply get past the fear. If enough people sign the initiative, if enough people circulate the initiative, if enough people contribute money, then they can't go out and go after everybody. And the more we get people of stature in the community, I hope that anybody that's holding a political office or is an acknowledged leader in the community who cares about democracy will sign these petitions to put this initiative on the ballot to give people a chance to vote yes or no. It's not saying you favor the change in the law. It's really saying you favor people being given the right to vote on this. I hope that political leaders and community leaders and people who are acknowledged in the community as having stature, even by the police, will sign this, will contribute to it, to give their, the protection of their participation to those that are on the cutting edge of political activity and suffering from official repression for engaging in such activity. Yeah, I think it's a uh, good time here to um, bring up our phone number again. Um, so our phone number, if you want to get involved, like Lanny says, everybody should be involved, it's area code 503-235-4606. That's 503-235-4606. And we can mail you the uh, petitions, and we hope that you go out and get signatures. And even if you put your own signature on it, that's... That's, um, that's great because we need everybody's signature. Um, 72,000 valid signatures approximately what we need. And there's a lot of registered voters out there in Oregon, and you among them. Um, so please call us up and um, get our initiative. I mean, we need help as well in the office. And, Paul, we have a, uh, the website? Yeah, uh, on our website you can watch this TV show. You can also watch uh, uh, hours of various video footage. We have the entire film Reefer Madness, uh, an hour and a half Australian documentary called Hemp Revolution. It's at www.crrh.org. The name of our political committee is Campaign for the Restoration and Regulation of Hemp, thus crrh.org. The .org is what they give nonprofit political organizations such as our own. So I want to urge you, you can even print our petitions from the net. You can watch literally dozens of hours of, of footage, uh, uh, very educational footage, uh, uh, on that website as well. Yeah, um, you know, I'd like to get back to the point. To me, you'd think that most people, the public, if you go up and talk to them, 
They say, you know, can a public official, while on the job, being identified as a public official, comment, you know, on a political issue? Everybody would say, well, no, of course not. Well, the, the distinction the law makes is between elected officials who have an obligation yeah. to comment and non-elected officials who are on the public payroll as, as civil servants or yeah. otherwise public employees. And I would think it would be clear that we don't want the, – the way this law originally came up, the, the, the whole context for the ruling, is an Oregon Supreme Court case um, in which the issue was fluoridation. And a municipal government had actually appropriated money to run a campaign in favor of fluoridation that was challenged by people who opposed the fluoridation. And the Oregon Supreme Court was quite clear that the government couldn't take public funds and spend them on one side of an issue, couldn't hire people to go out and campaign as they did in that instance on one side of an issue and print literature and all of those things. And while the activity in this case hasn't reached that level, the type of activity is exactly the same. Yeah. When Officer Jensen is sitting in front of the television camera questioning the motives and otherwise encourage, discouraging people from uh, signing this initiative, mm -hmm. his time is being paid for by the public, he's wearing his uniform, he's speaking in his official position as spokesperson for the police department. All of these are the checkoff points for whether he's speaking in his personal position and has a free speech right to say what he's saying, or whether he's speaking as a public official, which is forbidden under law and violates the Fourth Amendment, the Fourth Article of the Constitution. Yeah, I mean, it, and it's really clear, too, is that, I mean, at that time, you know, he was the face and voice of the Portland Police Department. That's the one that they would show on television every night whenever there was, you know, a gruesome murder or, you know, or whatever you want to talk about. He was the face and a voice that people saw, and so he was the official voice. Um, so it's just real obvious that, you know, that, um, you know, when me come up and ask him for a comment on this, he should have said, sorry, no, you know, come to me after hours over a beer or whatever, and I can tell you what I personally think. And there's another element here that people should be aware of. Uh, given the laws on confiscation of property and uh, taking people's property if they're arrested on a drug offense, the number of those laws target the proceeds of those confiscations to go to the police department. So you have police who essentially collect a bounty mm -hmm. when they bust someone on drugs. And that gives them a bias automatically in favor of a program that pays their salaries, it as is. opposed to changing yep. the laws that would deny them those access to those resources. So in the police, you even have a particularly biased group yeah. to be coming out and campaigning. Not that any group on the public payroll should be coming out and campaigning, but the police have every reason in the world to violate the law and engage in such a campaign, which made it even more important that the political leadership coming from Mayor Katz or the administrative leadership coming from Chief Moose say to those officers, this is not acceptable behavior. We can understand you may feel strongly about it, but you're not allowed to use your official position or official time to go out and campaign politically against this initiative. They had a, a, almost a doubly important obligation because this group would be so tempted to go out and protect their honeypot, you know. Yeah, they have a huge economic incentive to uh, continue the marijuana laws, and they never bring that up. You know, recently they tried to recriminalize marijuana here in Oregon, and I was down there lobbying against it. I can tell you that the only people that were lobbying in favor of it were the Association of Chiefs of Police and the lobbyists for the state police. There were no other lobbyists down there working on this issue except police officer lobbyists. And they're the ones that pushed it through. Unfortunately, we were able to stop that. Now we're circulating. We stopped it through the referendum process by gathering 90,000 signatures. Now we're circulating the Oregon Cannabis Tax Act to just completely end the war on marijuana users and to regulate and tax the sale of marijuana to adults, allow medical marijuana and industrial hemp. We need your help, so please call us at 235-4606. If you're outside of the Portland area and this show plays in Klamath Falls and Bend and uh, Ashland and Corvallis and Eugene and also on the internet. If you're outside the Portland area, it's 503-235-4606. That's 
235-4606. You know, you both are attorneys, Lanny Sinkin and, and Paul Loney, and you're the ones carrying this case forward. Lanny, you've had a distinguished past, in my opinion, <laughs> working for the Christic Institute, which would be familiar to any historians familiar with the Iran-Contra uh, debacle, and, and I wish we had a little bit of time to go into that. But uh, Well, I can touch on that briefly. The, the Christic Institute filed a racketeering case against many of the key figures in the Iran-Contra scandal. Um, we engaged in all kinds of efforts to gather evidence and uh, put it before the court. Four days before we were supposed to go to trial, the judge threw the case out. Uh, then he ruled that the entire case was frivolous, fined us $1.2 million, and we went up on appeal to the 11th Circuit. While we were on appeal, one judge was killed by a bomb. There was an attempted assassination of a second judge. We know from discussions with court personnel that those acts were attributed to our case, or at least linked in their minds to our case. So the appellate court at the 11th Circuit threw the appeal out, ruled the entire appeal frivolous, even though we had amicus briefs from major national organizations, religious organizations, legal organizations, political organizations, and there was another three or $400,000 in penalties assessed against us. They basically put the Christic Institute out of business. Uh, that case was about democracy. Uh, this case is about democracy. There are things that can be so controversial that the democratic system has a hard time dealing with them. In the case of the Christic Institute's uh, racketeering lawsuit, we were talking about 30 years of illegal covert operations, and the judicial system simply could not deal with the evidence that we wanted to present, could not allow the truth to come out that would expose these government operations and, and damage the faith of the people that their government was operating in their interest. Uh, so you had official repression of that lawsuit, uh, similar to what we've seen in the official repression directed against the hemp movement. But a, democracy is always a challenge because democracy means every one of us takes responsibility for making it work. That means every one of us is offended if someone is silenced by the government mm. or by a policeman mm -hmm. or by the mayor or by the city attorney. Every one of us should be offended when that happens because if everyone doesn't have freedom of speech, then no one really has freedom of speech. Uh, and only through the interplay of ideas and everyone's views getting on the table do we ever reach the best understanding as to what we should be doing. <clears throat> I'm sure right now there are major forces being marshaled to suppress information about global warming and suppress information about many of the other environmental things, the asthma e epidemic among children that's happening on this planet. There will be constantly be efforts to prevent information from coming out to the public that might change public policy to the detriment of groups that are engaged in things they shouldn't be doing. So you, democracy does require constant vigilance. Um, and I think Paul and I as attorneys <clears throat> are happy to take these kinds of cases to the federal judiciary, but we're also not uh, Pollyannish about it <laughs> no. in terms of what the federal judiciary can or will do. Uh, <clears throat> they're there to protect the Constitution and rights of the people, but uh, by now it must be close to 90 percent of the judges in the federal judiciary have been appointed by Richard Nixon or uh, Ronald Reagan or George Bush, with uh, President Clinton's appointments also being fairly uh, right wing generally, or at least middle of the road. The age of the, the liberal justice, um, you know, Justice Douglas, if he came back and looked at the justices who are on the courts now, would be appalled at the kind of uh, activist, reactionary judges we have who are undoing uh, many years of uh, civil rights and other protections that were established by the judiciary. Uh, you're fortunate here in Portland and us in Hawaii. We're in the Ninth Circuit. It is sort of the last bastion of democracy in the federal judiciary. So we're optimistic that these cases will be successful that we're bringing on behalf of the hemp movement in Portland. But we're not sanguine about what's happening to the federal judiciary in general and about the loss of freedoms that are taking place in the United States. We in Hawaii are committed to the sovereignty movement that in one form or another we trust the islands of Hawaii will leave the United States over the next five or ten years. Um, most people don't realize that Hawaii was an independent nation up until the late 1800s when a conspiracy by United States government officials and plantation owners overthrew the monarchy and then made Hawaii a state within the United States. Many of us in Hawaii support the idea that Hawaii should become independent once again. Then we won't have to worry about the federal judiciary in the United States. You will, however, continue to worry about them and we wish you well. You know, we need your help. We are hoping you are willing to stand up 
for your rights and help us put the Oregon Cannabis Tax Act on the ballot. So call us at 235-4606. If you're outside of the Portland area, that's 503-235-4606. You know, as this is airing, we have just barely over three months left to go. If in the past you've received some of our petitions, send them in now. Don't wait. Send petitions back into us right now. You know, we've sent petitions out to thousands of you that have watched this TV show, and we need them back. We haven't gotten very many of them back at all. So send them in. If you've got them, please send them in so that we can put them into our account. We've got to have all of our petitions by the end of June to be able to qualify the Oregon Cannabis Tax Act. If you'd like us to send you more petitions, we even have a business reply envelope. We'd be happy to send that out to you. Call us at 503-235-4606. Now, you can only circulate our petition if you're a registered Oregon voter. If you aren't a registered Oregon voter, though, you can still help us. We need donations. We need all sorts of help that a political committee needs. We want to pay petitioners. We need money to do that. So call us at 235-4606 or look at our website at yeah. www. Dot C -R -R -H dot o -R -G. You can even make a secure credit card donation through our website at www.crrh.org. Yeah, definitely. You know, um, we need your help in a multitude of ways. So um, just remember that it just doesn't. It isn't. You know, if you're not a registered voter, you can still help us out. And if you don't have money, you can still help us out. You know, we always have envelope um, stuffing parties. We have the mailing parties. Um, that, you know, and if you're a graphic designer, we can always use that for various, um, various events. But just remember, you know, that um, this is, we're out there to try and protect uh, the rights of all of us. Because um, it's easy to protect the right, you know, to say that, yeah, I'm a, you know, a Democrat or a Libertarian or a Pacific Party member. But when it comes to for the, you know, the more difficult things to change in hemp laws, that's when it becomes more challenging. I mean, it's easy to to stand up for the popular rights. Um, it's much harder, you know, if we get these more difficult ones. When you have police officials in a uniform saying that your idea is a bad idea, that's scary. Um, you need to stand up to that. Well, I appreciate you lawyers coming in and standing up for our, all of us in the federal courts. You know, as, as Thomas Paine said a couple hundred years ago, now's the time that sunshine, sh sunshine patriots will shrink. But you folks are standing up uh, and, and we hope you will too. <clears throat> so call us at 235 4606. Most people don't realize that they, they, they use the Shakespeare quote, first we kill all the lawyers. If you go back and actually read the play, the reason they wanted to kill all the lawyers was the lawyers were defending the rights of people to do things. So to get what they wanted, they first had to kill all the lawyers. Oh, is that it? So That's what it was. To be meant able to rob everyone else. To be able to yep. get past them to get at everybody else. So that's what exactly, that's why, you know, that's what at least some lawyers do is protecting all of our rights. So help us out, 503-235-4606. Good night. Yeah, thanks for watching. I'd like to thank uh, Lanny Sinkin from traveling from the islands of Hawaii to come here and help us. My pleasure and much aloha to all my friends in Portland and all those I haven't met yet. Good night and tune in next week for another exciting edition of Cannabis Common Sense.